It is Thursday, December 7th, 2017. My name is Ashton Ellett. Uh, we're here with another installment of the two-party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining us today is Mr. Steve Anthony, um, late of the Georgia State University, uh, longtime aide to Speaker Tom Murphy. Uh, thank you very much, Steve, for, for joining us today. Glad to be here. Really do appreciate it. Uh, if you go ahead and tell us a little bit about uh, your childhood, your upbringing, um, how, how Steve Anthony became Steve Anthony. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to decide what I want to do when I grow up, but uh, uh, up to that point. Um, I was born and raised in Rome, um, which back in the 50s and 60s was, was a fairly interesting place. It, it had a higher than uh, average uh, black population, uh, Floyd County. It had a higher than average um, uh, industrial base. We had three or four or five plants there. So we really had an interesting environment. And um, I mention that because it was a very political uh, county. Mm -hmm. uh, and my father was very involved politically. Um, he never ran for office, but um, he was very involved. Um, and was chairman of the Kennedy for President Committee in 1960. Okay. Uh, for basically, it was for Northwest Georgia. And um, so I was always around politics. Um, on my mother's side, uh, I am a descendant of the Clay family. Um, I'm kin to Chuck Clay and Marietta. Uh, I am descended directly from Henry Clay's uh, uncle. So I'm once removed many generations down. Sure, um, sure. Uh, so a lot of, lot of uh, connections that had me interested in politics. And then, of course, the generation I was in as, as I started to reach adolescence and teenage years, uh, that was the 60s and uh, the early 70s. Uh, graduated from college in 73 from what is now the University of West Georgia. And so I was always involved in politics. I uh, interned uh, uh, to get my last 10 hours of college credit. I interned in Washington in 1973, which happened to be the summer of the Watergate hearings. Right. So I got to go to a lot of those. <clears throat> there were a lot of hearings across the hall from my congressman's office. Uh, it was the uh, Armed Services Committee of the House with Eddie Abair <laughs> and the John McCord and John Ehrlichman and all those people were coming by. So it's, it's just all through my life I have been exposed to and fascinated with not only politics but government. And uh, since I was a young child, I had always wanted to be an attorney. So I went to uh, undergraduate school and then applied for law school. But around my senior year in college, I kind of came to the conclusion I didn't want to really practice law. But I thought getting a law degree would still be very beneficial. So I did that, mm -hmm. got out of law school, graduated from law school, um, went down to the capital, state capital, uh, cold. Um, well, I'll take that back. Um, a state senator from, from Rome had taken me down to meet uh, Zell Miller, okay. who um, had just become lieutenant governor. Okay, so this would have been 75? 75. And um, um, introduced me, and you know, so I told him, you know, we're looking for a job, and he said he didn't have anything. We'd be back in touch. Several months later, I went uh, back on my own to the speaker's office, and I kind of knew of Speaker Murphy. Uh, he was from Bremen. I'm from Rome, forty miles up the road, and uh, I walked in cold to him. Talked to his um, head person and told her that I was looking for a job. And she said, well, I'll keep you in mind, stay in touch. So I took her literally at that. I called <laughs> about every week or two. <laughs> anything, anything, no, no, no. And then finally she called me in the, um, uh, this was actually, I'll take that back, this was around 77 after I got out of law school. Um, I, she called back in the late summer of 77 and um, said, would you come down and do a part-time job for us, do a, be an aide to a study committee? 
And it was a study committee chaired by Representative Calvin Smyrie, who was very young back then. I was to he's say now it. the dean as we speak <laughs> in 2017. He's the dean of the house, uh, seniority wise. Uh, but he was doing a study committee on victims' compensation. So they mm -hmm. uh, employed me, so to speak, <clears throat> to be the aide. Uh, that got finished, the session started in 78, and she said, do you want to stay on part-time? And keep in mind, I was married uh, and had a child wow. um, all during this time, all through law school and everything. And um, I was assigned as the aide to the Speaker Pro Tem, Jack Connell. And during the session, an aide back then now, keep in mind, uh, the uh, General Assembly staff was skeletal. Yeah, I was I was going to ask you. It was how, very, how did the there were there were very there. few people. There were a few part a uh, few full time people in the Speaker and Lieutenant Governor's office. Okay. A couple okay. of full time people in the majority offices and minority office, and uh, other th everything else was hired just for the session. Okay. So, but there were a couple of committees in the House that were deemed busy enough, important enough to where they had full time aides, and so an aide to what was called the State Planning and Community Affairs Committee. Uh, left and they offered me the position of taking his place. So I did. So after the session, I transitioned into there. Down on the first floor, we shared an office with Appropriations, which at the time was chaired by Joe Frank Harris. And uh, of course, he was from Cardinal, so right. a whole bunch of Northwest Georgia people Se running around there in the quadrant. District. This was uh, correct, the old Seventh District, which was the John Davis, the congressman right. I had interned for. And um, this was euphemistically referred to as Room 100, which was the name of the room, but it also meant a lot of other things because people were always going down there to see Joe Frank for budget requests. So um, I was in that position the rest of 78, 79, 80. Uh, in the... Uh, night before the session for the 81 session, um, the chair of the committee had a stroke. The Sunday night, it was Super Bowl. It was Philadelphia and Oakland <laughs> playing. And um, he had a stroke, and his wife called me to tell me all this. And, of course, she was at the hospital and distraught. Um, and to jump ahead just for a second, he sure. ultimately recovered okay. and, and, and served for another year or two. His name was G.D. Adams, great guy, great man. But anyway, the next morning the session starts, so I go into work and I immediately go to the speaker's office and uh, get a hold of his chief uh, staffer and say, i got to see the speaker. She said, well, he's busy. And I said, no, I've got to see him. And I leaned over in her ear and I said, GD had a stroke. And she jumped up out of the chair and busted into the office and he looked up at her. She said, everybody out. <laughs> and uh, cl we closed the door and I told him. He said, oh, God. And he said, who's the vice chair of uh, the committee? And I told him and he said, oh, God. Now, keep in mind, the speaker appointed all these people. Oh, sure. sure. Maybe later in the interview, I'll explain to you how we went about the yeah. appointments and it was his philosophy and approach. Oh, we, to it was I, I, de very, I, de I definitely want to get it to was very, Speaker It was Murphy. very great. It was one of the great times every two years of working there. But anyway, then he said, well, who's the uh, secretary? And I told him, he said, oh, God. He said, son, can you run that committee? Uh, now, this is stuff I've never told anybody, and I think it's long enough of <laughs> a way to where I, I can say, he said, son, can you run that committee? And I said, yes, sir. So, you know, the vice chair, you know, became the, the titular acting chair head, yeah. and, you know, did the agendas and all that. But I became very, very <laughs> involved. And that was also the committee at the time that um, handled all local legislation. I'll be honest with you, I'm not even sure now if it still does. But back then, for decades after that even, it held, handled all local legislation, which is very important to anybody that knows the process of the General Assembly here in Georgia. Local legislation is by far the most bulk uh, of bills that are ever introduced. And uh, so after the session, everything went good. And after the session, uh, he promoted me to the Speaker's office. And that was what year? This again? was in 1981. 81. 
So I started to work there in 77, and in 81, I got promoted to his office. About, that was like April or May, because back then we finished in early March. We got in and got out. <laughs> uh, so April or May, I, I moved up to the speaker's office, and uh, about three or four months later, that uh, head of the staff uh, that I had been referencing, she retired. Okay. And so from that point on, he started giving me duties and stuff. That we had no titles back okay. then. Okay. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you could say just by reference that what I was was the chief of staff, but I was never called that. I, uh, I didn't have a business card. <laughs> uh, we would go to functions, uh, receptions or stuff that were outside the, uh, you know, in the public, and people would uh, start talking to me maybe and ask, you know, who I am, what did I do? And every once in a while, if he was standing there and he heard him say that, he would turn to him and say, he does any damn thing I tell him to do, <laughs> uh, which was fine. Uh, and, uh, but, but ultimately, I, I was... Uh, uh, I handled a lot of stuff there in the office. He had a, a what was called then a personal secretary. Okay. Uh, we had a receptionist out front, and we had one other employee. Uh, we had a, uh, a media office that actually served the entire house, right. both Republican and Democrat. And the head of that would do some stuff for the speaker periodically, but a lot of times I'd be the one that would do the research or so forth or put bullet points down for speeches. He hardly ever had written speeches. Um, and then we had a research office, and I'd coordinate that. Uh, so, and then I became like the supervisor of the staff because sometime in the 80s, late 80s, uh, we brought what is now the legislative office building. We brought that online, and overnight, uh, the full-time staff of the House went from like 15 to 90. And so I kind of became the liaison supervisor, if you want to call it that, um, of them, uh, in addition to handling the house budget and the uh, session budget and the um, employees that we brought on during the session. So anyway, uh, I was his, I was in that position with him from 81 through 95. Um, and as we talk, I'll recount some things that oh, were sure. going on then, but uh, just again, Continuing with the short bio, although it doesn't sound like it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, in 95, after the session, uh, and this was Zell Miller's first year of his second term. Right. Uh, and in 92 and 94, the Republicans had made, had made significant gains. Uh, they had picked up like 60-something seats. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, mm -hmm. leading into 92, uh, the General Assembly was 80% Democrat. 25 years ago, the General Assembly was 80% Democrat, but they had picked up um, about 60 seats. So in 95, after the um, session was over, uh, Governor Miller called me down to his office and wanted to talk to me about uh, possibly moving over to the state Democratic Party as the executive director because of all these losses that had occurred in 92 and 94. And we talked about it. He said, I'm not offering you anything. I just want you to talk about it. So I went back, and next time Speaker Murphy was in, I went in to see him. Of course, he knew about it, <laughs> and uh, he and I talked a while. That was March. Uh, the decision by all of us was not made until May, uh, at which point uh, I left. Um, and it was a tough decision because I didn't want to leave the Speaker. This was 95, and uh, I knew he wasn't going to uh, be running and serving for a whole lot longer. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't overvalue myself, but I, I knew that we had developed into a good team. Um, and um, I just didn't want to leave him. But I also knew the state of affairs politically. And I had enough confidence in myself, um, which Governor Miller had exhibited by offering me the position to go over there and uh, turn things around. So in 95, in May, I left and went to the state party where I was executive director through 1998. Who, who were the chairmen? There were two chairs. It was, a, And I kind of kid about this. Um, 
it, it's there were there was a lot of I was there for three and a half years, so that's you know forty two months or whatever. About thirty of those months, I didn't have a chair. <laughs> uh, John Blackman was chair when I went over, and then he retired or resigned uh, later in ninety five. Uh, the governor was in no rush to appoint a replacement, and uh, but he finally did, and he appointed Michael Coles, who was chair for a year or so. Okay. And then he resigned to run for the U.S. Senate right. against Coverdale. Right. So uh, that occurred. <laughs> and then when Roy Barnes became uh, the nominee of the party on the 98 ticket, he appointed David Worley. So those were the chairs I had, uh, but there was a lot of times when I didn't have a chair. And okay. I, and I just basically, you know, uh, the way the Democratic Party was set up then was that the governor totally controlled the deal. I mean, there was a state committee. He would make a recommendation. The executive committee would uh, make the appointment of the executive director. The executive director hired all the staff. So, um, but... I answered to the governor, <laughs> right? And uh, and and Steve Wrigley. I, I basically answered Steve Wrigley because I would call him every day if I had to. I didn't call him every day, but if I had to, that's who I would call. And then if it was something really above both of our heads, you know, he'd go to the governor. Uh, and uh, I've I've said, and I say this with a great deal of pride, and I'll elaborate on Zell Miller later. Um, I may be one of the few people if not the only one, that ever had Zell Miller and Tom Murphy as a boss and um, in an official capacity. And so I uh, went over to the state party. Uh, almost immediately after I went over in the spring of 95, Sam Nunn announces that he is not going to run next year, the 96. Right. So I'm faced with that. Uh, but we get Max Cleland, he gets nominated, and we get him elected. We had a couple of other elections in between, uh, local municipal elections, kind of along the line of the uh, city races this year in Atlanta, uh, where we had uh, Democrat-Republican matchups. Mm -hmm. And Newt Gingrich had actually gotten involved in the Savannah mayor's race, so I asked if, if we could get involved, and we won. The Democrat won, Floyd Adams. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I spent the rest of the time getting the party out of debt, getting everything prepared for the 98 cycle trying to uh, stop the bleeding in the 96 General Assembly races. We only lost like three or four or five seats. Uh, and then in 98, uh, we actually gained a seat or two. And then, of course, we put together what uh, I refer to as a great, great ticket uh, in the 98 cycle and won a resounding victory uh, with Roy at the top of the ticket, uh, um, Mark Taylor, um, Michael Thurman, Thurbert Baker, Kathy Cox, uh, Joe Martin for education, although he didn't win. Uh, we had a great ticket. Uh, and and uh, sadly for the Democrats, this was 98, so almost 20 years. Sadly for the Democrats, that's the last time a ticket's won. And uh, Mark Taylor won again in 02, uh, but uh, nobody else of any major office won, uh, has won since then. So when that was over, I realized, well, I got to get a job. <laughs> so um, I um, went down to Georgia State and talked to an old friend of mine, the uh, chair of the political science department, and uh, asked uh, just cold. I'm saying, you know, I know nothing, but I've always wanted to teach, and I knew I couldn't in my previous life. And Glenn Abney, and he said, yes, I'd love for you to teach Georgia politics. And I said, okay. And he said, it's not taught right now. I said, okay. He said, here's a book you can look at. Uh, it was a book written by Arnie Fleischman and Carol mm -hmm. Piranuski. Sure. Um, and he said, develop the course. And I said, Ooh, okay. So I started part-time. I also got into governmental affairs. I worked for a small firm for a little while and then started my own business uh, in December of 99 taught part-time, and I say that euphemistically because I actually taught three classes each semester, which was actually in violation of the rules, 
Uh, but I taught full time, but I was a part time. Uh, okay. Staff. Sure. And I did lobbying. Um, I did political campaigns, which I didn't think I was going to do, but uh, all the people that had known me through the years wanted me to get involved with them. And I did races all around the Southeast, actually, eventually. Uh, I finally phased out of that. I became full-time uh, lecturer in um, 09. Okay. Uh, and I reached uh, senior lecturer status in uh, 14. And um, I phased out of my uh, lobbying. Uh, I do represent university professors pro bono and still do that. Uh, so I taught for 15 years from 99 uh, through 14 and um, went to Kennesaw State for a six-month gig uh, to help out in the study abroad program for Italy. Um, that finished up in the end of June. And uh, in August, my wife and I, she took a sabbatical um, and we moved to Italy and lived in Italy for six months. What part of Italy? Uh, in Tuscany, a little a little mm -hmm. community right at the edge of Tuscany and Umbria. Okay. A little place called Anghiari. My uh, my aunt lives in Trentino. Oh yeah. Up the, up, up sure, on the sure. up in the Alps. Right, right, right. But my uncle's from right. from Tuscany. Cold weather, but beautiful, beautiful. That's right. There's more Germans than Italians. Right, there. right. That's, that, that's the joke. Right. Anyway. So we had been going to Italy for a number of years. I'm half Italian. And um, we came back in February of 16. My wife went back to her employee, and I've been retired. And that's basically my life since. <laughs> well, well, 51. Well, I also, I was born on July 4th. I always thought that had a, a role in my interest well, there, in there government you, politics. Right, right. Well, what we're going to do uh, is sort of dig deep, you know, dig down right. into the into right. the weeds okay. of, of this very long and illustrious <laughs> career. Um, I've been very fortunate, I'll be honest with you. I've been really lucky. I um up until the time I taught, which is a different kind of gig, although oh, sure. teaching <laughs> is a public servant, although a lot of uh, professors don't see themselves as public servants, but it is a public servant. You're paid by tax dollars mm -hmm. if you teach in a public mm -hmm. university. Uh, but I always did what I wanted to do. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to do what I wanted to do and get paid for it. And um, the whole time I was at the Capitol, the whole time I was at the state party, and most of the time uh, that I was teaching, I never dreaded going to work. I mean, I was very fortunate uh, in that regard. And um, I am also very proud of the fact that I was uh, part of, a very, very small part of, a huge effort that uh, what I, that it was what I refer to as the golden age of Georgia when uh, the leaders of this state took Georgia from where it was up into the early 70s until the turn of the 21st century and really uh, took Georgia from uh, desolate desolate means to being one of the leading states in the South, if not the nation. And I was, I was around that for a good part of that time. And I just, I, nobody could have a more fulfilling career than I've had. Right. It, you know, what I was thinking is, is you've worked in, in Georgia state government uh, under administrations, George Busby, Joe Frank Harris, Zell Miller. Right. Yeah, yeah. What, what, political scientists would call sort of the 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 managerial governor sure as opposed to the the, the showman the the good time charlies and, and i i don't mean to lump jimmy carter and carl sanders in in, in that or, or even ernest vandiver to a degree uh but this was very much a pro-growth sunbelt era right uh in, in which you worked right um right so you were you were interning with John W. Davis. Yeah, you're very good. And, 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 <laughs> you're and very John, good. John W., not, not right. John C. There was uh, a John Davis in South Carolina. Right. right. Um, so this would have been 74. 73. 73. 74 is when he loses to, to Larry McDonald. Larry I, McDonald. I, can tell you, I've got a, I guess I've 72 got a, he actually beat McDonald, but, but right, 74. Right. No, you're there. right, and I have a very rich history. With Larry McDonald, I'd like I'd like to not you know we're at a time where if unless you 
no You've got to give a prelude to who Larry McDonald right. is. Right, even yeah. the John Burke Society. Sure, sure. Um, Larry McDonald came out of nowhere in 71, 72. And again, I'm from Rome. Uh, McDonald lived in Vinings. Mm-hmm. At that time, the 7th District of Georgia was Cobb County to the south, Tennessee to the north, <laughs> Alabama to the west, and uh, Bartow and Gordon in Chattooga County and mm-hmm. Walker County up the east side. So uh, Cobb County, at, during that time, Cobb County, Floyd County vied for being the right. seat, right. so to speak, as far as population and power. Um, and John Davis, frankly, was an old friend of my father's. And he and, was uh, from he, Summer. He was from, gosh. Is it Somerville? I'm not sure. I can't remember. Because he was like a circuit judge and stuff before he ran in 1960. But um, yeah, because he, but he, he was, was from more North Georgia. He was yes, not from Cobb County. Correct. Absolutely. Right. And he's not from Bartow, I'm almost positive. So McDonald comes out of nowhere, runs against Congressman Davis in 72. I go there in 73. We're dealing with McDonald, and we're starting to learn, you know, just who he is, who, what the John Burt Society is. Although I had read... Um, I'm um, showing my age now, but the book that was put out by uh, um, the uh, person that was running the John Burt Society uh, at the time. Welch. Welch, uh, yeah. 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 It's, it's not none. It's a big, dare, thick, dare black book. Treason, and anyway, I, I read it. And uh, so I kind of knew what the John Burt Society was. And, uh, you know, we, we knew it was a serious thing. And it was extremely right wing. It was extremely rare. McDonald was a Democrat, mm-hmm. um, but he was getting the exact vote from people whom Trump has gotten the vote from that you would now define as, given the events of the last year, as his core, core vote. Mm-hmm. Those people were John Bircher followers 45 years ago. Sort of. They were Larry McDonald's core vote. Sort of the, the, na- the nationalist. The economic, uh, the, uh, yeah, nationalist, get us out of the UN. Uh-huh. That was their big phrase. Uh, and econ- get the fluoride out of the water. Economically get fluoride out of the water. It's all communist plots. Um, and they kind of fell by the wayside, just jumping ahead, when communism fell because they didn't have a boogie bear to, to <laughs> latch on to anymore. But anyway, McDonald uh, runs again in 74 and, and beats Congressman Davis. Um, now, of course, he beats him in the primary. So my dad, as I had mentioned earlier, was, uh, you know, uh, a leading Democrat in Floyd County. So McDonald sets up a meeting to come meet with my dad with one of his supporters there in, in Rome to gain his support for the general election. And uh, I'll never forget, we were in our living room there in Rome. I, was, I came over because this was 74, um, and I was married but had not yet moved to Atlanta to go to law school um, and we sat there and met and uh, McDonald talked about I'm gonna uh, and I point this out only because again it's so reminiscent of our current person that's in the office of president um, he talks about some house resolution that he's going to vote for and he get, he rattles off this number and and I had just come from Washington less than six months ago, and uh, I didn't learn everything there's to learn in three months, but I, I learned enough uh, to where I knew he was just making something up, and so I sat there, and I'm like 23 years old, 22 years old, and I said, uh, Mr. McDonald, or Dr. McDonald, because mm-hmm. he was a dentist. He, no, no, he was No, no, a, he was a urologist. Urologist, urologist excuse me. Uh, I said, Dr. McDonald, I said, that number, that's not a real bill. That's that's a number that doesn't exist. Well, well, it doesn't really matter. My, my point is what, what's in the bill. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we meet for about an hour and my dad says, I will never vote for you. So you, you guys were, you were Quincy Collins? I, well, I think that, it was, that was later. That was later. That was later. This, uh, I forgot who he ran against in 74. I, I can't, I'll be honest with you, you have to go back and look at you. Quincy Collins ran in 78 and maybe also in 76. I'm not sure he ran in 74. But in I any mean, event, it wasn't any big deal because whoever the Republican was, whoever it was, was no threat at all. So 76, 
uh, this young man that worked at Lockheed approaches me. I'm in law school, but I live in Cobb County. He hears about me, uh, and he hires me to run his campaign against McDonald. His name is Ken Butterworth. And I ran his campaign for Congress against McDonald. And there was also a uh, labor-backed candidate, and that's a phrase you don't even hear anymore <laughs> in the, here in Georgia. The, the machinists. You right, know. right. Uh, he, Ron Burke, uh, Ron something. Uh, and he ran, uh, but we came in second uh, and lost making the runoff by 2,000 votes, and we spent like a fraction of what McDonald spent. But anyway, we were butting heads with McDonald all during that time. And McDonald wins, then he beats Collins, mm -hmm. and then in 78 he runs again. I think Collins does make his big effort then, and my dad headed yeah. up the Northwest Georgia Democrats for Collins. Okay. And he wrote this long letter, which I've saved, that was in the paper. I'm a lifelong Democrat, I'm a Kennedy Democrat, I'm a Roosevelt Democrat, I'm never voted for a Republican, I'm voting for Quincy Collins. So you, this is 40 years ago when you were starting to see this little bit of stuff starting to happen that became prevalent in the coming decades in other parts of the country and then in the South later. Uh, and then in 83, McDonald gets killed. Right. I am the chair of the Cobb County Democratic Committee. And um, I just happened to have had lunch with this person the other day. We were reminiscing. Um, like the next day, uh, one of the uh, TV stations comes to my house to interview me. Mm -hmm. And um, we're talking about what we're going to do and all this, and I make it very clear that we, the Democratic structure in Cobb County, is not going to support McDonald's widow, Kathy McDonald. And I said, and I think we've got a great candidate, a guy named Buddy Darden, who was in the House and had been the DA in the Cobb oh, sure. circuit yeah. earlier. And I just, you know, I threw his name out there for a reason. <laughs> but anyway, Buddy ran. Buddy made the runoff, and Buddy became the congressman for the 7th District. And uh, eventually, uh, 10 years later, getting defeated by, by Bob Barr. But so that was my relationship. But during that time, McDonald was um, Congress. Um, I was part of that time. I was chair of the Cobb County Committee. Yeah, how, how did that work out? Well... You know, it was, I can remember every election cycle, the members like Al Burris, John, Joe Mack Wilson, uh, the other, uh, Roy Barnes, who was in the state yeah. Senate, yeah. said, you know, he's he's on our ticket. We're all here together. We're going to uh, run together and run as a ticket. And, and frankly, um, and this is the nuts and bolts of politics, McDonald brought people into the Democratic primary to vote for him that wouldn't have come otherwise. And those men that I talked about, men, because they were all men at the time, um, they got those votes. And so those people stayed with them in the general election, continuing to vote for that ticket, so to speak. And this was during the 70s when Cobb was really starting to change, becoming Republican. So, so you think that in the eighties? So you think that, into that, the 80s? that Larry McDonald's presence on the Republican Party's ticket, or the excuse me, the Democratic Party's yeah. ticket, was instrumental in holding those those white conservatives? That, yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so during that time, once or maybe twice a year, McDonald and I would meet over coffee or something, and he and I would talk, and so. Uh, during that same time, I'm working at the Capitol, uh, there was something called um, the Red Carpet Tour mm -hmm. that the Chamber of Commerce put on where there would be one federal official and one state official and they'd tour around oh, mostly right. South Georgia to plug in the happenings of the General Assembly, your state government, in areas where people didn't get a chance to hobnob with these people and all the lobbyists would travel with them and all of that. And so one year, Tom Murphy and Larry McDonald did it. And the speaker came back. And remember, <laughs> the speaker uh, came from a very conservative area of mm -hmm. the state. He had very conservative constituents. They, it, it's, it's just another whole book to talk about how conservative they were, but how they idolized Franklin Roosevelt. Because Franklin Roosevelt meant more to the South than he did to the rest of the country. When the Depression came, you know, the old saying in the South said, what Depression? Uh, but they were conservative. Um, and many of them were segregationists. 
Um, the speaker was certainly of a different cloth, but he came back and he said to me after it was over, I didn't go on him. He said, uh, boy, I tell you, that McDonald's crazy. <laughs> He said, he said, you know, I'm kind of conservative, but he said, that guy's crazy. <laughs> uh, so that was my relationship with Larry McDonald. I also had a very uh, interesting relationship with Newt Gingrich also, who taught me in college at, at West Georgia. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But McDonald, McDonald uh, and I'm not comparing Larry McDonald and Newt Gingrich, um, but Larry McDonald, he and I used to talk, like I said, and I came to this conclusion about Larry McDonald. He actually educated me. He showed me that you could vehemently disagree with somebody on virtually every issue. And I'm going to say virtually because I can't think of one where we agree, but there might have been. But virtually every issue, yet respect him. Okay. And I respected Larry McDonald for one reason. He absolutely was an unfailing, dogmatic believer in what he believed in, and he never, ever compromised or cut corners to gain political favor. And I respected that. And he and I would talk philosophically, and I never could find a kink in his reasoning. I didn't agree with it. But I never could find a kink in it. So he wasn't some sort of a an opportunist or a Absolutely craven not. sort of. He believed position. what he believed. He was who he was, and he went into the political arena, and he was either going to succeed or fail with that uh, recipe, mm -hmm. and um, he succeeded. Why do you think he was so successful in the old seventh, which you know the economy was so dominated you know, in the seventies? It's hard to to overstate how important Lockheed, Georgia was to the entire well, economy. there were two things that were important to the 7th District. Lockheed was one, sure. and the carpet industry right. was the second. Right. In Especially up in the Northwest. From right. Rome northward. Yeah. Um, well, of course, defense was a big thing with right. him. And, well, uh, but the reason he succeeded there, he would have succeeded in almost any part of rural Georgia. Okay. But, but r Northwest Georgia was then and was after that. And I think still, to a great extent today, a very economically depressed area. Sure. The carpet sure. industry that I mentioned collapsed uh, 20 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it, it, it it's interestingly has a huge medical community now in, in northwest Georgia. But it, it is economically nothing like northeast Georgia. Right. South Georgia is worse, but there, nobody lives in South Georgia anymore, regretfully. And I say that, you know, with a broken heart because I love, uh, it, it hurts me to drive through South Georgia now. But, but there's a lot of people that live in northwest Georgia, but it's an economically depressed area. And uh, his, his um, uh, appeal, his message appealed to those people. And he drummed uh, anti-communism economic prosperity and, uh, you know, governments against you and I'm going to come in and save you. Again, very Trump-like. You mentioned Newt Gingrich um, before we get back into, you know, your work with Speaker Murphy and then your work with the Democratic Party. T tell me about meeting Professor Gingrich. Well, I was at West Georgia from 69 to 73. Okay. He came there about 70, I guess. I don't know. Um, he was still in his 20s. He had gotten his doctorate, I think, at mm -hmm. Emory. Uh, uh, Tulane. Tulane, yeah. Tulane. Master's at Emory. Or maybe he was part-time teaching uh, in Emory. He had some connection he with he Emory. Did. He, he did. And he came there he to did. West Georgia. So um, I majored in political science, but I took a lot of electives in history. In addition to minoring in history, I wound up like five or ten hours short of getting a double major. So I took a lot of history. Newt was a history teacher. And... Um, People like Floyd Hoskins and Mel Steely um, were history professors, and I loved taking them. But um, I forgot what. I, I had Newt for some class. I can't remember. And then I had Newt, Mel, and Floyd for a triumphant class. They all three taught it. It was the history of America after World War II. Oh, wow. <laughs> and Floyd Hoskins with a whole... Let me tell you. <laughs> Mel was great. Floyd Hoskins was an SS officer. I mean, he was, 
<laughs> I mean, uh, not SS. He was a uh, oh, oh, OS. Oh, 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 uh, OSS. I was like, Steve, where, where, no, where no, were we going? No, OSS. He, he was in the precursor to the CIA. <laughs> okay, okay. In World War II. I mean, he was high up. And he would sit there and tell us tales that were just mesmerizing. And Newt was a uh, professor, a doc, he'd just gotten his doctorate, uh, fresh out of school. And he basically stayed in the back of sure. those two guys. I mean, they were incredible. But, you know, we would get to know each other. So anyway, I got to know Newt. And, there, you know, I like Newt just like everybody else did. Newt was liberal. He was a Rockefeller guy in uh, and, Tulane. And um, we, you know, I would go to his office in the Humanities Building, and I'm still very involved with West Georgia. I'm on the board of directors of the Alumni Association. I endowed a scholarship there. I'm, I'm very, you know, invested there. And um, some of this stuff that I'm talking about, um, I've been able to share with people so that they can use it uh, in the library there and then, yeah. and, then, and then the Murphy, you know, exhibit where right. we recreated his office there on the bottom floor. Uh, I would go talk with Newt all the time and you could walk in, sit down, talk with him and we'd talk politics. Da, da. So anyway, the fall of 72, I get up, getting ready to go to class, get the paper, Carrollton paper, and on the front page it says, local professor to head Nixon reelect. And I look at it, and I am truly dumbfounded. So I go down to the building, and I go into his office, and I take the paper, and I throw it on his office. And I say, what in the hell? <laughs> and he says, what? And I said, you're for Nixon? And he said, well, I'm not for McGovern. And I said, well, I can understand that. But I said, you're going to be, he said, I uh, am um, going to ride Nixon's coattails. Nixon's going to get reelected. I'm getting involved in local politics. I'm going to run for Congress. I said, as a Republican? And he said, yes. He said, Steve, this state's going to become Republican. And I said, in your lifetime? And he said, yes, very soon. I said, Professor, I said, come on. He said, the House of Representatives will be Republican one year talking about the U.S. House, and I said, again, when? And he talked a little bit. He said, Steve, I have a plan. And I've said this publicly before. I, he said, Steve, I have a plan. He said, I'm going to run for the House. And I said, against John Flint? He said, yes, which he did in 74, 76, and 78 when he ultimately won. And um, he said, I have a plan. I'm going to run for the House, and one day I will be Speaker. And I'm like, Okay, fine. I walk in, I thought, God, he's lost his mind. He's just, you know, something. So that's my senior year, the uh, fall of my senior year. Um, he runs. I go to law school. He runs, gets beat, runs, gets beat, runs in 78. At that point, I've started work at the Capitol, and uh, he wins. And just so happens, he is now Tom Murphy's congressman. Yep. Because they're, Harrison County is in the 7th District. So they start a love, not a love, hate, they have a hate, hate relationship. But I'm, I'm working with the speaker. And, uh, you know, into the 80s, Newt's trying to rise up and, you know, starts becoming uh, an officer. And uh, just absolutely, you know, leads the effort to... Um, create a Republican majority. He absolutely did that. He did a lot of it illegally. He did a lot of it um, through um, deceitful means. Uh, but he what do you, spent what do you, what do you mean by that, deceitful well, means? Well, he used Kennesaw State to teach a course that, that really shouldn't have been allowed to be there. He produced... Um, cassette tapes and so forth and how they got funded and all this stuff. I mean, there's, but this was back before disclosures were required. <laughs> so when I say that, you can take it with a grain of salt if you want to. But uh, he, he had to, in effect, in a way, sell his soul to a lot of people to get the capital to do what he had to do. Not that that influenced his political thought, but he did become much more conservative outwardly and maybe inwardly. But he wasn't the college professor 
uh, that he was in Carrollton. And you can talk to anybody that was there then, and they'll all tell you they'll describe him the same way I described him. It's no secret. He um, does all this work during the 80s, is beating on the leadership of the Georgia Democrats incessantly, mostly Tom Murphy. Uh, we wake up one day and in the paper, you know, he's calling us uh, thugs. And we really, you know, we really just don't get along. And, and of course, the fact that I have my connection with him and the fact that I'm with Tom Murphy and the fact that Tom Murphy's his constituent and all of that um, led to the speaker ultimately trying to reapportion him out from the 7th District in the, in the well, 90s. He, he, would, he would have been in the the third because Buddy Darden yeah was wasn't a so he would go right. from the third got, to the yeah, sixth right 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 yeah okay yeah um, right um well no uh, Gingrich was in the sixth I that's believe. right I believe it was the sixth back then um, yes yes and so the speaker I mean this is jumping ahead to the early nineties speaker reapportioned him over into Cobb County which by then had become kind of a different place from the seventh mm -hmm. and was put into this but. In of course, in '94, they take over the House. He gets elected Speaker, and you know, Speaker Murphy and I and others are in the office, you know, commiserating. Um, and the Republicans in the House um, and the Senate pass a resolution to invite him down, and so he can say hello, and and they can honor him. And the Speaker Murphy says. I guess I got to agree to this. And, we, you know, we all said, yeah. And so anyway, uh, in January of 75, uh, 95, um, Gingrich comes down. And I always was in charge of logistics for stuff like this. I mean, I met so many people that were guests from Muhammad Ali to Ray Charles. I mean, you, you name it. Anybody that came through, I got to spend a few minutes with because I handle logistics and usually for the house they would come back and be in a holding pattern in our conference room in the back of our suite of offices. So, you know, we're sitting there, we're waiting and uh, Newt comes in with a couple of Republican house members into our office mm -hmm. and, you know, a couple of his aides and he comes in, you had to come in the front door and then turn and come in to where myself and Speaker's personal secretary was, okay. and then the next office was Speaker's office, and then the next one was conference room. We turned and came in there, and my desk was back this way next to the outside window, and he makes a beeline over to my desk. And, of course, the cameras are following him, you know, because, you know, it's, a, it's an event, news event. So he comes over and he says, Steve, you know, and I, had, I have not seen him. This is 95. I had not seen him for... 20 years, although we had corresponded. Sure, sure. Indirectly. But I had not seen him for 20 years. He comes over to me and he says, Steve, so good to see you. And I said, Mr. Speaker, it's good to see you. And he said, you and I have come a long way. And I said, Mr. Speaker, I think you've come a little bit further than I have. <laughs> but I said, I appreciate it. Thank you. So, yeah, you know, I was one of his former students that, you know, had become the aide to the House Speaker. And, and he actually went in that day, and, and you can get this from GPB, the recording. He praised Speaker Murphy up and down and said, my goal is to be the kind of speaker Tom Murphy has been. He said he wrote the book on how to be an effective speaker. Now, history proves that in four short years, he didn't pay attention at all to that book, <laughs> apparently. But he was exceedingly gracious to Speaker Murphy in his <laughs> remarks. And then, uh, you know, in 98, that was it. Well, I, I, guess, I guess that that's a sort of a good segue into talking about Speaker Murphy because, you know, let's see, I've done about 25, about two dozen of these interviews, and, and Speaker Murphy has always been described in the, the strongest of terms. Uh, the most common phrase is dictator. Only by Republicans. Correct. <laughs> that would be by, by mainly by Republicans. Tell me about Speaker Murphy as you knew him. How you know, who he was as a person, his political ideology, uh, and how he ran the House, and sort of his sure, influence sure. on state politics. Um, first off, on the dictator thing, uh, <laughs> and Rusty Paul, I was when I was at the state party mm -hmm. when I went there in '95. 
um, and Rusty was chairman of the state Republican committee. Right. And so he and I started appearing on TV programs and news programs and stuff. And this was early on. And he kept referring to Tom Murphy as a dictator. And I, and so the first time I ever did this, I had to do it like three times. First time I ever did it, it was on a program with Hosea Williams, who was one of Martin Luther King's lieutenants. Um, he turned to me and got ready to ask the next question. I said, Reverend, I said, first, I want to say, and I turned to Rusty and I said, Rusty, Tom Murphy is not a dictator. A dictator is somebody that takes office illegally against the will of the people. I said, Tom Murphy was duly elected as a House member and he was duly elected as Speaker. Stop calling him a dictator. You may not like what he does or his style, but he is not a dictator. And after a couple of times, Rusty stopped using that term. Um, and in retrospect, <laughs> the way he ruled is nothing compared to how <laughs> some Republicans have ruled since then. But um, he was really two different people. Okay. He was a certain type of speaker when he first came in in 73, December 73, until the 80s. And then from the 80s until the time he left in 02, uh, he was a different type of person. Now, a lot of that is growth. A lot of that is experience. A lot of it is just him aging and understanding things. Um, he had absolutely no training politically. Everything he did was by instinct. And so where early in his career, he dealt with people trying to do things about alcoholics, and he called them drunks, uh, evolved into him leading the way to pass uh, health care legislation that targeted the needs of alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, so he grew as a person. Um, he was also very progressive. Um, he appointed uh, the first black chairs of committees, uh, the first women. Um, he uh, tried to go as far as he could go progressively uh, that his caucus would allow him to go. Which was then a much more rural, oh, conservative yes. yeah, yeah. caucus. Very much so. Uh, Male-dominated, uh, white, although there was a black caucus. Sure. Uh, and it grew. Um, but, you know, the most fervent backers of him when he got challenged, uh, not only in 76, but especially in uh, 92, I think, by DuBose Porter, uh, black caucus voted for him 100%. Um, he was a Roosevelt Democrat. He truly believed government existed to take care of those that cannot take care of themselves, but he believed that they should do it within their means, meaning he was a fiscal conservative. Mm -hmm. He was a quintessential Southern, mo modern Southern Democrat, uh, uh, socially progressive and fiscally conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he felt um, that uh, a group of people needed help, he would lead the fight to fund it. But he would make sure that the numbers that were brought to him by our budget office could be justified. Uh, he led the fight to increase funding to Grady, big time, big time. I wrote a book, um, Witness to History, and I detail some of these things in there about examples of him governing like this. Um, he did not follow hardly any uh, game plan that you see nowadays simply because you didn't have to back then. We had an overwhelming, as I said, we had 180 members of the House. For a lot of that time, it was like we had like 150-something Democrats. And um, so he didn't have to worry about the opposition. What he did have to worry about was keeping the caucus together enough uh, but almost always we have what's referred to as an absolute majority, which means more than 120 for, you know, overrides or two-thirds votes or vetoes of the governor or anything like that. Uh, he was very strong-willed. He was very thin-skinned, uh, but he gave a, a rough, tough appearance. Um, he was willing to take the bullet on behalf of his House members. 
And that's why they, in turn, provided him with loyalty. Um, he never, ever told a committee chair that they had to do something, except one time. And that was on uh, abortion bills. Mm. And, and it was judiciary. And he said, it's the law of the land. And uh, I don't agree with it, but it's the law of the land. And um, so no abortion or quasi-abortion bills ever came out to the floor of the House while he was Speaker. Um, well, I take that back. One time he sent me down to tell the chair to adjourn a committee, but it was because the chair had lost <laughs> control of the committee. It didn't have anything to do with what was on the agenda. But um, he, he didn't dictate. As a matter of fact, the last 10 years or so of his tenure, uh, we would have a... Uh, leadership breakfast every Monday during the session and we would get there like at 7 o'clock and try to be through by 9 we went into session at 10 they'd get back to the Capitol at 9 and we would debate uh, the bills they would debate the bills that were going to be brought up that week and he would let the room talk and he would let the room vote and sometimes they voted to pass or not pass a bill that he disagreed with but they walked out of there going to do the will of the majority not he never stood in there and said we're going to do this or we're going to do that he would say i don't like that i don't agree with it i wish you would listen to what i'm saying but if the majority voted to be for or against a particular bill that's what the caucus did what what was his his working relationship or your office's working relationship with the Republican leadership, Johnny Isaacson. It was nothing. It was no, there was no need to have any working relationship. And that was very frustrating to the Republicans. We, mm -hmm. you know, looking back on it, we probably um, could have handled things a little better. Now, let me hasten to add that there were many Republicans that we got along with, we respected. They got along with us, they respected us. There were a lot of Republicans that from the day they walked in the building, they started trashing Tom Murphy. Well, his attitude is, I don't need them, and I'm not going to pay any attention to them, and they're never going to get anything out of here. But that was, they, they defined the initial relationship. And if they were good, he, he reciprocated. So he had a good relationship with Johnny. Uh, he had a good relationship. I could name any number of people uh, that he had a good relationship with, uh, going way back to names nobody would recognize anymore to more current names. Um, he... Um, never called him in for any counsel, though, or anything like right. that. There was no need to. Even in 92 and 94, when our majority went down to like 130 or something like that, or 125, 110. Um, so, so there wasn't a phone call to Bob Irvin to, or something? No, no. And he never made one of them a chairman, committee chairman. But everything else was equal. If a Republican wanted to stand up and dominate a debate on the floor, he let them. If um, they wanted to um, have a certain uh, person appointed to a committee, which we did all committee appointments, uh, he would allocate spots to them. Um, contrast that with uh, 04 when Glenn Richardson came in, and they reduce the number of uh, committees that Democrats could be on. All Republicans were put on four committees and all Democrats were put on two and things of that nature. They changed the rules of the House as far as debate to cut off debate just like Washington. They adopted all the rules in Washington. And there was something that was always said around the Capitol back in, in my day is that, you know, if we start emulating the way Washington does things, we're sunk. Um, so, you know, he kept everything fair. He told me one day, sitting in his office, just like we're sitting here now, we were just shooting the breeze. And we had had, a, it was right after an election, we had had a, a good year. And he said, Steve, remember, he said, we need a certain amount of Republicans. He said, we, we need to have them to keep a balance. He said, not too much, but we need to have them to have a balance. And as long as they respect the institution and are coming here to do a, a job that they feel Whatever it is, if they, if they respect the institution and do the job right and not here for themselves, he said they will help make us a better institution. 
what were what were the hardest issues that your office had to work on? Was it something like reapportionment, transportation, those the transportation reapportionment? Eighty one, you came in. Uh, was a big reapportionment year. Yeah. 91, yeah, 91, was even, was even 91 was even bigger. 91 was where we had it handed to us on a platter. Talk to me about the reapportionment process. Re- well, reapportionment would and absolutely be the uh, most bloodletting uh, activity. Now, the budget every year dominated. Sure. And the budget every year was most important and could be tough. And it could be tough if we had money and everybody wanted some, or it could be tough when we didn't have money and had to cut. Um. But reapportionment is the most political of activities uh, a legislative body can engage in if if they do it. Some states don't; they don't do it. Um, just pitting friend against friend. Sometimes you cannot avoid putting two incumbents into a district of the same party. Mm-hmm. We approach reapportionment differently than the Republicans have, and not only here in Georgia but nationwide. Um, it's the number one reason why Congress is dysfunctional now. Not dysfunctional, unfunctional. Um, in the House, at least. Obviously, the Senate it doesn't apply. Um, but reapportionment is tough. It is so tough. And, and the fact is, it's in a special session, so it's short. Mm-hmm. And you near the end, you're working late at night, every night. It's tough. In 91, um, and Zell Miller was governor, um, we had to reapportion, and the Black Caucus made a deal with the Republicans through the Bush White House, Bush One, um, to engage in this new type of reapportionment, which ultimately was thrown out by the courts by the mid '90s. But it resulted in a district in Georgia being created that started in South DeKalb and stretched down basically I-16 to Savannah, uh, picking up what we call the uh, Black Belt, which is where all, uh, d- uh, not all, but a lot of blacks who were actually descendants of slaves and got free land after the Civil War, they, they live in a lot of those counties. Majority minority counties. Right, and right. they created a majority minority district. This is Cynthia Cynthia And McKinney's. then Cynthia McKinney ran and got elected in that. And we did not know that this coalition had been put together. And we did not know that it had already been greased with the Bush Justice Department to approve it. And so we really didn't take it as seriously as we needed to. A, a young man here that's from Georgia, I mean, went to the University of Georgia, wrote a, a thesis on this. I can't remember the name of it. Um but he wrote about this. It was Miller v. and then the court case that came from, which was Miller v. or somebody v. Miller. I forgot now. Is it Miller v. Johnson? Johnson. Johnson. That's it. That's it. Um, that was the first uh, show in Georgia of the way that reapportionment eventually evolved in this country. And again, like I say, that district got thrown out. A similar one in North Carolina got thrown out. Um, and... Um, and then Roy Barnes, because of this, in 01, mm-hmm. and I'll never forget talking to Bobby Kahn about this, who was his executive secretary, chief of staff. I said, you're getting ready for real apportionment. And he said, yeah, we're going to start from scratch. And I said, what do you mean start from scratch? He said, we're going to not operate off the existing districts and tweak them. We're going to get rid of all districts and go from there. And I said, you got to be kidding, Bobby. I said, please don't do that. Anyway, I talked to Roy, uh, the governor, uh, later about something, he called me on my phone. And I said, how you doing? He said, I'd rather have my teeth pulled. He said, I'm getting ready for reapportionment. He said, I'd rather have my teeth pulled. I said, I know it's going to be tough. Well, I didn't get into the same conversation with him like I did Bobby. Uh, but basically what they did was they tried to create these districts for the House and the Senate and Congress. Tom Murphy said, you ain't doing that for the House. I will draw the House map, and that's what we will pass. And that's what he did pass. And that map survived a court challenge. The Senate and Congressional ultimately got thrown out because the way they did it was totally wrong. They based it all on quote-unquote voting patterns, Mm -hmm. which in Georgia meant (laughs) most Democratic votes in the primary were black, so it was racial. Mm -hmm. In effect, a rose is a rose no matter what you call it, and it was based on racial profiling, and um, those were thrown out. And then because of that, the Republicans, when they took over a couple of years later, they, you know, kind of said, we're going to do reapportionment too. But 
they took it to another higher level, if you want to call it that, maybe a lower level, but they took it to a, a different level. Um, and, you know, it's just been horrible ever since. And not just here, but all over. In, in Congress, all over the country. I mean, it's the stuff Tom DeLay ran into trouble in in Texas. He, he's the one that developed the blueprint for all this. Well, there are a couple of Supreme Court cases percolating up, up in Washington. What, what do you think the future of, of partisan redistricting, re, partisan okay, reapportionment You can't take politics be. out of politics. Mm -hmm. And I said a minute ago, reapportionment is the most pol political of activities. You can't take politics. I, I laugh at people that say, we're going to have a nonpartisan appointed commission. We're going to take it away from the politicians in the General Assembly and appoint a commission. Well, who appoints the commission? The governor, I would assume. Of course. Or the governor and lieutenant governor and speaker. They, they're politicians, and they're going to appoint a majority of whoever party they're with. And... Um, it's always going to be political. And I'd rather have people in the room that have something at stake than some mm -hmm. business person mm -hmm. that doesn't have a clue and is still partisan, but is going to create even more havoc. Um, it, it's a problem. It is a real problem. And that is why I have told my students uh, when they asked if Georgia would ever become Democrat again, General Assembly or whatever, and I said, not in my lifetime. Because they first got to get over this hurdle of reapportionment. And that is why you hear Democrats, which I just totally disagree with, um, say that uh, the demographics or, you know, the trends are in our favor where they're basically saying we can't do anything. We don't know how to do anything. We're going to sit back and just wait till nature takes over <laughs> and the state becomes full of Democratic voters again. Well, that's stupid. Uh, because it's not issue-based or anything else. And, and who knows, you know, as long as the Republicans are in the General Assembly, the Republicans will keep carving up districts. And so when are you going to get to that point? It'd have to be overwhelming. Well, uh, the, the, we just had a series of, of special elections to fill mm -hmm. um, legislative seats, two of which were, were the 117th and 119th here. Right, right. Athens, yeah, yeah, Oconee yeah. County right, area. Right, right, right. And the talk is that those districts are going to be reapportioned. Absolutely. Um, Let me tell you what the Republicans have done. And I, I've really gotten out of partisan politics, but I'm telling you about something that's factual and who did it. <laughs> and so I'm using labels so that people that may view this understand who's doing it. Um, they will look at a race and uh, an incumbent Republican will win re-election but you know, maybe by the skin of their teeth. And they will go in and analyze where they lost votes from the time before or whatever. And you can do all this so much better now than in the old days. It used to be so hard. Even, even uh, in the 90s, in the 80s, computers started becoming more prevalent. The 70s were just, it was just hard elbow grease. But uh, they can go in and pinpoint where blocks are that are yep. bad, and they'll just cut those two or three blocks out pew, 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 and redraw the district and not even tell, you know, uh, anybody. Uh, and if it's a Democrat and the Democrat won, they'll do that and won't even tell the Democratic House member that they did it or, or Senate member because the state Senate in Georgia is also reapportioned because they run in districts. They're not statewide like a national. So uh, they are always tweaking, always, always, always. And the fact is, the uh, demographic shift that's talked about is happening in very specific areas. That, that it's too concentrated. And it's to... too concentrated. It's where a vast majority of people in Georgia live, but you can only slice them up so many ways, and you can string them down in, and dilute down into more rural areas. The fact is, right now, Next year, in the 2018 elections, um, the Republicans who have 100 and they had 121 seats or something, and now they may have 119, they're still bumping around an absolute majority. They've got a long way to go to get below 91. A long way to go. So I'm trying to think how we get back to because uh, <laughs> because I do I would do, I do want to talk about that but I, I also want to talk about since we're, well, since we're on the topic of demographics and changes you were you were county chairman 
county Democratic chairman in Cobb County while you were Speaker Murphy's mm -hmm. AA chief mm -hmm. of staff. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? And what was it? Like? These were not hitty times for Democrats in Cobb County. So you were sort of on the front lines of witnessing the Yeah, the I, I, had, realignment. Uh, I had been uh, on the county committee in Floyd. Okay. Um, when I was in college, you know. And um, the year that I lived there, I, li I would live there a year before we moved to Cobb for me to go to law school. Um, and so it was just natural for me to look up and join the Cobb committee uh, once I moved there. And so that was like 77 or whatever. And so by 81 or 2, I think 80, I had... Uh, been around long enough and gained enough uh, friendships and support to where um, I ran for chair of the committee and got elected. I asked Speaker first if I could do it, and he almost said no. He thought it'd provide problems. So Joe Mack Wilson and Al Burris and some others, Bill Cooper, and said, told him that, you know, to let me do it, that they needed me and they thought I could do a good job, and that was their words. And um, so he let me do it. So I was chair for, for four years. Uh, and it was the time. Cobb started uh, swinging Republican in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And by the 80s, um, it was barely hanging on. And by the mid to late 80s, it had become Republican. Was it only hanging on for the Democrats because of the rural parts of the county? Yeah, no, it was hanging was it on for two reasons. The individuals that were in office, and then when they literally died out or right. got beat. Al Burris died. Mm -hmm. Joe Mack Wilson got beat. Bill Cooper, I think, either got beat or retired to avoid getting beat. Um, plus, back then, Cobb County had two house districts mm -hmm. with five posts. Multi-member districts. Multi-member districts, correct. And so we were able to dilute um, any effects that were going on at the time. Hmm. So th so what was, you come into that job, what, what are your top priorities as, as a county chairman? I had, I had very simple priorities in the beginning. One was to, to uh, pass a new uh, set of bylaws for our committee. Two, to raise money. And three, to develop a um, long-term game plan. This sounds a lot like your, your job as executive director well, of the party. It, it, it <laughs> trained me well. Okay. It, absolutely. It trained me well. And uh, I think to some small extent, you know, the fact that I had this experience helped that. All of that uh, are in my papers at University of West Georgia that I donated. Uh, and I went back and went through them, I don't know, in the last year or so and, and looked at some of that stuff. And, I, and I'm going to say that I, I, I am very proud of it. I mean, it was very prescient about what was going on and what we needed to do to stay in power. Um, it wasn't difficult. It's just nobody was doing that. And that was the problem with Democrats back then. Democrats by the mid-'80s, and I'm talking statewide, the state party, and many counties, had become so complacent. Mm -hmm. There was no need to ever. And, and I lived in Cobb County. So... I can't name you the kind, the number of times that we would be sitting around during a lull or after a meeting was over and that people weren't leaving yet to go back home or whatever, and we'd sit around and talk, and I would tell them, listen, there is a wave coming in this state. It is taking, I said, let me tell you what's going on in Cobb County. And I would tell them, I said, Cobb County is a mirror of what's going to happen in the rest of metro Atlanta. And actually, it had actually happened in DeKalb first. Right. But it switched so quick. It didn't last long because of the heavy black population. But it did happen for a little while. Um, but I kept telling them what was going on. And um, in election year, I would tell them what was going on in the elections. And I said, I said, we have got to get our act together. And, you know... I'm going to say this is to their credit. I'm talking about Tom Murphy, Jack Connell, Bill Lee, Larry Walker, all the leadership, Terry Coleman. Um, they were focused on, on governing. They absolutely didn't want to fool with any of this other stuff. They were focused on governing. And so it kind of fell to me through the years, and this is really more why 
Governor Miller, I think, asked me to be the head of the party was I headed up the House Democratic Caucus for mm-hmm. a long time as the staff person for that and developed all the game plans and did everything. I worked with Hamilton Jordan. Um, he did work for us pro bono. Um, I handled all of that, and I did a lot to, to stave off the, the wave that started coming in the 90s. But um, I told them, I said, you wouldn't believe what they're doing out there. I said, and, and they were talking, and somebody, I think it was Larry Walker, kind of zeroed in on something I said, and he said, well, Steve, why? Like, if you know Larry Walker, he's from Perry. He has a, he has a southern Georgia accent as opposed to my mountain twang. He said, Steve, <laughs> why, why do you think they're able to do all this? And um, this is what I said, and it's true. You know, I don't know if it's indelicate or not in these times, but <laughs> I said, Fair point. Larry, they've got one great advantage over us, a tremendous advantage. And I said, it's just become obvious to me in the last year or two. Our women, our Democratic women, our spouses, our mothers, our daughters, they work. I said the Republican women don't work. They provide an incredible army of volunteers that do all this stuff from teas to stuff in envelopes to going out to functions. I said they've got a literal army of women power. <laughs> I said we don't have that luxury. Democratic women are working. And, of course, that's a reflection of the economic difference between the two parties at that time. How would you describe, uh, compare and contrast for me, if if you will, the Democratic apparatus, the Democratic Party apparatus, its organization, versus the Republican apparatus and organization and how those grew and developed during your your time? I, you know, obviously saw it firsthand. And um, it was a great study. I I guess I could write a small book about it at some point. Um, The state Republican Party until the 90s existed in the back pocket of whoever the chairman was. And until the 80s, it was dominated by the Eastern Establishment slash Rockefeller type Republicans. They were not socially conservative. They were not even sometimes fiscally conservative. When we, when people would start, you know, we'd start meeting people, all the influx of people that would move into Georgia, and they would tell us, I'm from New York, I'm a Republican. I said, oh, you'd make a great Southern Democrat. (laughs) And they were actually many times more liberal in in some areas than a Southern Democrat. And I'm not talking about race at all. I'm talking about economics and and other stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so the Republican Party was non-existent, which meant if anybody wanted to run, they had to do it on their own. Then in the 80s, and you've done some interviews with people, and you tell me if I'm saying this sure, wrong. Sure, sure. In the 80s, a revolt took place. The religious right took over the state Republican apparatus and took over the state party and everything. A good friend of mine, Joyce Stevens, and uh, Marguerite I, Williams. I just, from spoke, S- just spoke to Joyce on Joyce Friday. Joyce would be a great person to meet with. Um, Marguerite Williams in uh-huh. South Georgia, who was a big donor and big supporter of Republican thing. Became all, all Zell things Miller's are, best friend. She became Democrat because they pushed her out. It's just like the Trump people pushing out all this other wing or two wings or three wings of Republicans now. So they took over the party in the 80s when the religious right, you know, came to the ascendancy in the 80s. And um, it was still a mess. I always said, um, if I don't have to tell you that the Republicans are incompetent. The fact is they're not in power. This is in the 80s. They're not in power. They've got an incredibly popular Republican president who carried Georgia, and they don't have hardly any seats at all in Georgia of elected offices. At the local, state, congressional, any level you want to look at, I said, so don't tell me about what the Republicans can do. They should have taken over the state in the 80s. So the Democratic Party was always run by the governor, as I said, Uh, but because we had such a dominance, and because we were doing a great job of governing 
and people were reacting to that. And because um, we had big numbers in the General Assembly, there was nothing going on. I mean, if you were at the state party in the 80s, you had nothing to do. And then, you know, it just kept building up, all these people moving in. It kept building up and building up and building up. And let me throw out a couple of stats right here so people have an understanding of what we're talking about. In 1965, there were about three, less than three million people in the state of Georgia. By 2000, there were almost 10 million. The budget, state budget, went from 1 billion to 18 billion without any tax increases, I might add. As a matter of fact, there were some tax cuts. So that's what kind of growth we experienced during what I refer to as the golden age of Georgia. But this started building up and building up, and it was in concentrated areas, Savannah, Augusta, mm-hmm. somewhat Columbus, somewhat Macon, somewhat South Georgia around, as I was saying, Thomasville and Valdosta, uh, and then the uh, suburban counties around uh, Fulton and DeKalb, and originally, and then it's grown since then, but... Um, it became a point of uh, critical mass by the early 90s. And so in the 92 election, Republicans won a lot of seats. Yep. In the 94 election, they won some more. All the low-hanging fruit they captured, uh, and that's when Zell came to me about going to the party. So uh, all during the 90s, the 92 success of Republicans, the 94, the 96, all during this time, Rusty Paul was chair of the committee. Rusty Paul is a moderate Jack Kemp, uh, supply side <laughs> Republican, who actually worked for Jack Kemp mm-hmm. uh, Up in the HUD. Department of yeah HUD. Uh, I I give him total credit for making the Republicans the majority party when he did, making them uh, operate like a state political party. What he did was up until that point. The Republican philosophy was to uh, attack elections from the top down. Let's get a great person to run for governor or U.S. Senate, and it'll trickle down. It never worked. One reason is they couldn't get to the right of us. Sure, sure. Um, Rusty came in, and I keep kidding him. I don't know how you got elected chair, but more importantly, I don't know how you stayed chair. <laughs> he went in and he basically told him, here's how we're going to operate now. Mm-hmm. Now, the uh, the religious right that I mentioned earlier, because they had floundered so much, they kind of lost uh, credibility. So he still had them to worry about, but he was not part of them at all. But he went in and he told him, said, here's our formula for winning. We're going to start at the grassroots level and work our way up. And he said, we ain't going to do anything in 90 or 92. And actually, they did in 92. But So they started, at that time, 80% of local elected officials in Georgia were Democrat. By 96, the first election I was in charge of at the party, Democratic Party, it was 50%. <laughs> and now it's about 70% Republican. So he started building a ground team. He started building a B team. At the same time, the Democrats had not done that. We lost a whole generation of leaders in the Democratic Party because people like Bill Lee and Tom Murphy stayed around so long, which wasn't bad. And we got new people that came in in 88, the Doug Teepers and Ken Postons and uh, people like that uh, came in in the late 80s. But at that point, so the age I'm given, at that point, the 35, 45-year-old person, we didn't have anybody. We had a bunch of 25, 30-year-olds and a bunch of 60-year-olds. So we lost a whole generation in there. So Rusty, so we started losing local races, so we had nobody to run for state races, and state including General Assembly. And um, eventually that's what turned things around. And... Now, it was delayed. I mean, the Republicans didn't take over. Roy Barnes lost an 2 when he absolutely should not have. Okay. But it would have happened. <clears throat> if it didn't happen in 2 it would have happened in 06. So it's really amazing the Democrats hung on till 2 
well, what, given all of this? What, why, is, why is that the case? Because of the type of people we had in office up to that point. But when that last generation left, that was it. They'll never be seen again. The, the likes of them will never be seen again. You you can't find. There's, there is a, I, I will say this, there are a couple <laughs> of members of the General Assembly now who would fit the mold of being a social progressive and a fiscal conservative who could stay in the room with a business leader and talk their language but also tell them we're not going to be for religious freedom and we're not going to you know we're not going to do anything to harm you. The reason we hung on so long in Georgia was because of these people, but that doesn't explain it all. It was what they stood for. They believed, as I said about Speaker Murphy, that government had a role, but fiscally sound role. And we will do everything we can for them. At the same time, we will look after the business interest of this state because the business interest is what drives us. Go back to the 60s in Atlanta, the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s for Atlanta. Atlanta came to the realization, both black and white leaders, and of course the black leaders were black leaders within the black community, and then they eventually became leaders of the whole city. They realized the most important color in the universe is green. Talked in sort of the, the Auburn Avenue elite. Right, uh, right. The Hartsfield uh, uh, and, Allen and, Coalition. Right. Okay. And they believed that green was the most important color. So they focused on creating a favorable business climate. The whole time we were in power, we took care of the business interests of this state. But we didn't forget the downtrodden. So we looked after, quote, our constituency and the Republican constituency. What could they do better than us? They could do nothing better than us. Why would somebody vote to throw us out? Well, enough people moved in from other parts of the country that all they saw was an R and a D and mm -hmm. thought we were a D of a certain uh, description, which was not true, and they voted for the R, which may or may not have been what they thought. And we used to say, sitting in the conference room, this is up into the 90s, we used to say something would go on and we'd do something and somebody with Georgia Power or some company would push back. And we'd say, you know, the minute Republicans take over this state, the entire business community will switch over to them. And that's exactly what happened. They, they got along with us because it suited their interest. We took care of them because it was good for the state of Georgia to grow. Again, three million to 10 million. Right. And everybody benefited from that. Now, interestingly, 04, let's say 04, and here we are in 17. In just over 10 years, the Republican Party of Georgia has managed to almost totally alienate the business community of this state through their right-wing social agenda, which if they had, you know, the, the Speaker Ralston is pushing back as much as he can. I probably shouldn't say that publicly because they're... They, that, that group would love nothing better than to beat him. And, and to be fair, Go Governor Deal as well has, has, he has vetoed numerous he pieces has, of legislation. He has. But he doesn't deal with them on a daily basis like Ralston does. And um, they are just about on the verge of losing the business community support. The, the sad thing for a Democrat is that the Democrats haven't been able to take advantage of that because they haven't realized the dynamics of what's going on. Oh. They have become an incredibly liberal party in this state from the time we were there. Okay, walk, walk me through that. You know, the, as you've already mentioned, that the, the, the Republicans take over uh, the governor's mansion in 2002. Sonny Perdue wins, right. surprisingly. Right. Um, Let me tell you a quick anecdote sure, on sure. that. Uh, I was teaching Georgia politics. I have Johnny Isaacs. I had a, a guest person from the real world that would come speak once or twice a semester to my class. So I asked Johnny to come. Johnny's a good friend. I almost got him to switch parties in the early 80s. Um, he's a congressman. He's in Newt's seat. This before he runs for okay, the Senate. Right, right. He comes in 02, the day before the election. He gives his little talk. He's taking questions, and the guy, uh, somebody says, uh, well, what's, what do you think is going to happen tomorrow? And he said, oh, Barnes is going to win. He said, I don't know if I'll see a Republican governor in my lifetime. He said, Barnes will win tomorrow. So 
<laughs> well, that's how big a surprise it was. Right, right. But and yeah. then Sonny was uh, quoted as saying supposedly the line. I don't think he knew this, but the line from the candidate at the end. Uh, now what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> but fr from there, it, it's a very. In, in political terms, a very rapid succession of, of success. The, the, the Senate with, with Jack Hill and, and the well, others he got party switch. switching over. Right. Um, and then 04, the House comes. 2010, every statewide constitutional office, that's where we're at today. Uh, although the Republicans no longer have a supermajority in the Senate since uh, uh, right. yesterday's right. off election. Right, right, right. Um, what what is it going to take for the the Democrats to what does the road back to, if not majority status, <laughs> competitive status? Well, let me uh, give a disclaimer first. Okay, uh, I'm not involved in politics anymore to uh, to any extent. I will I, I've given interviews. Mm -hmm. I've been asked questions. Um, I've written a few pieces. Uh, but I am not in the combat anymore. I don't want to be. The way it is now is not what I was in, and I, I detest it. So I don't really care. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I serve my time. Uh, but I do have a thought. Okay. And, and I do have an opinion. Uh, and again, which I, I think I wrote a piece a couple of years ago. My answer to that question is something that 90%, no, 70% of Democrats in this state would reject. Stacey Abrams has blatantly rejected it. Not well, once me directly, and then and then every indirectly every time she opens her mouth about the new coalition she's going to create. Um, the way the Democrats can become pertinent again, I think, is to go back and try to take the best parts of what was done before when we had the majority, which is to fight for the downtrodden, uh, realize that government has a role to help, but it's not the panacea, and to not treat the business community like the devil incarnate, and to divorce <laughs> themselves from Washington. Right now and for 10 years, the state Democratic Party is totally controlled by the National Party. And believe me, we went to great lengths to make sure they never came in the door. Is it because the resources Yeah, they've got there? money and they can give them money and so they, you got to dance to their tune. They had money then. We rejected their money. And I'm not talking about just when I was there. I'm talking about before me and the leadership. Uh, Speaker Murphy, I don't know that he met three times with national leaders. Um... There is a winning formula. The problem is um, practical liberalism is almost non-existent anymore. I, I, it, you know, I'm not trashing liberals. I'm trashing practical. I'm trashing those that aren't practically liberal. There, there's, there's a big difference between Republicans and Democrats. Okay. Democrats, liberal Democrats, look at the world through rose-colored glasses and don't realize the severity of who their enemy is and what they will do to win. Republicans are willing to do whatever it takes to win, and they absolutely run over Democrats because of that difference in approach. The only successful presidents have been a black person, which was a unique thing, and Southerners, Clinton and Carter. Now, on the national level, at taking all the votes as a whole, you know, you've got that dynamic with Democrat, the Democratic candidate winning a majority of the vote almost every time. But when you come down to the state level, mm -hmm where there are borders, when you come down to congressional level, where there are borders, general assemblies, where there are borders, um, you cannot rely on the totality of a vote. You've got to be specific. You've got to recruit the right kind of candidate. People like Scott uh, Holcomb, Stacey Evans, uh, Bob Trammell, uh, that's just some of the names that come to mind. Those are people that 
should be the future of the state Democratic Party or state Democratic effort. Uh, we can talk about parties <laughs> ad nauseum too, political parties. Um, Democrats have gotten too much torqued up into the national issues and national approach. And um, I, I don't see any movement right now to change that. Dubose Porter certainly seems to be okay with it. And um, I, I just, they, they, as long as they follow the formula they followed in the last 15 years, they'll never win again. So how, how would the Democratic Party begin to win over say the business community or donors from the business community is there a way to win those over without well, first, winning elections you go ahead with Bert, you've got to win them over first to win the election yeah you've got to develop relationships with them mm -hmm. and that's what i'm saying too many democrats don't even want to be in the same room with a business person they're not anathema to each other <laughs> i mean they don't you've got to build a relationship first and they've lost all those relationships and are not willing to rebuild them. Most of them are not willing to rebuild them. Um, the um, trust factor is everything in politics. Hmm. They, they're not going to, right now, they're not going to decide to give you their vote and support until you convince them what you stand for. So they're not even willing to say what they stand for, but if they did, most of them would say things that the business community would reject. So first you got to get them to listen to you, and then you got to say what it is that's going to appeal to them. And that's not saying say whatever it takes to get elected kind of thing. As I said before, you present a dynamic to them. You, we used to present to them all the time, we've got to do this over here for this downtrodden group. I'm not going to pick an issue or, or a group or whatever. But we have to do this. And they would say, now nah, you're wasting our dollars. Look, if we take care of this, that's ultimately going to put money in your pocket because we're going to have more to do, less. We won't have to do as much for them. They will then contribute. They will spend, you know, that kind of thing. That connection doesn't seem to exist anymore. So what, what does the Democratic Party... Um, that, that, here's a question I, I, I ask everybody. You know, Repu I ask Republicans what the Republican Party stands for today. Mm -hmm. What does the Democratic Party, and we, we we can talk about the Republican Party as well. What does the Democratic Party of Georgia stand on? What I what are no what are its priorities? I have no idea. I have no idea. I I, I mean, really, I I mean, they they talk in bumper sticker phrases. But it's all the stuff from national. It's nothing anybody around here wants to listen to. The biggest thing they had, and Stacey Evans was a proponent of this, was protecting the Hope Scholarship. If, if you went back and said, what's the number one thing that stands out where Democrats push back against Republicans that wasn't, you know, partisan like reapportionment or something like that, somebody, most people would say, well, the Hope Scholarship seems to me the Democrats fought to preserve the Hope Scholarship. Mm -hmm. So, so, you, so what you're basically saying is, is it has to go beyond an issue here like hope or pushing or advocating for the expansion of Medicaid, which will would most likely not happen right. unless a, a Democrat right. is in the governor's mansion. Um, what about well, the no, 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 no. A Democrat being in a governor's mansion won't be enough. General Assembly's got to that. Be that is true. That, <laughs> that, 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 that that was changed in, in fourteen, right before fourteen. Uh, what about the Republican Party? What does the Republican Party stand for? Right now, mm -hmm. I think the image of what the Republican Party stands for is something that many Republicans cringe at, and that is that a significant number of them, maybe the most vocal, maybe not a majority, but the most vocal, stand for telling government how to operate, individuals how to operate, what you can teach, how you can worship, how you can congregate, that kind of thing. And that can cut across a number of issues. They, they come across as a group of people telling you how to live your life. And to the extent that that's been rejected, uh, it's great pushback. And the Democrats ought to be able to take advantage of that. Well, now... What you mentioned, 
you'd, you, we've mentioned religious, religious liberty, restoration, RIFRA, uh, Senator Josh McCoon, who's running for lieutenant governor, that there, there is a very real division within the Republican... Is he running for lieutenant governor or attorney general? Secretary of State. Secretary of State. Secretary of State. Okay. State. David Schaefer is running for... Uh, right, David right, Schaefer and right. uh, Jeffers, I think, right, right. are running for lieutenant governor. Uh, so there, there is, and you've mentioned Speaker Ralston is one of them, to an extent, the Senate leadership, but also Governor Deal, have been very vocal in this is bad for, one, the image of Georgia, and then two, Georgia's pocketbook. Right, um, right. Sort of, sort of where you were and the well, Democratic Party was with the business yeah, community yeah, in the 80s. Yeah, and let's, let's take that as an example of the yeah. rhetoric that surrounds it. The Republicans that are against it are pushing back because what it'll do to the business community and the economic viability of the state. Right. The Democrats, the what's their rhetoric about it? it it's, it's much more personal moral freedom and your, your lifestyle and all that kind of stuff. Two totally different reasons. And they're both valid. Oh, sure. But sure, sure. every once in a while, can't the minority leader of the House and Senate throw in, you know, we're looking after the business community? That's a great example of how their rhetoric is so different, even when they're together on an issue. Right, and I, I would uh, transportation, for example, something that that isn't as uh, partisan. Hot, hot button right. of an well, issue. Well, it's hot button, but it's not as, partisan. As, or as as a social issue, yeah. where it takes uh, democratic votes to pass, uh, you know, the, right. the, the the transportation tax overhaul, right. Right. overhauling the gasoline tax, which. You 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 witnessed the fights in the eighties between between uh, Lieutenant Governor Miller and Speaker Murphy and 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 uh, Tom Moreland over over those issues and that it finally came around and it was passed because of those pro business Republicans uh, and urban Democrats mm -hmm. right um, rural conservatives still on the outs as they were in the seventies and eighties but that's because of population decreases so. It, it seems like what you're saying is there is a practical alliance that does happen on certain votes, yeah. but that sort of practical politics isn't spun off into partisan advantage. It's not seen anymore. Practical politics is not practiced anymore. It's all partisan. And even when the division is along uh, geographic lines, Mm -hmm. Transportation being a great issue, mm -hmm. rural versus urban, right. the rest of Georgia versus Atlanta, it still has to degenerate into political partisan rhetoric. It can't, you know, be uh, discussed in a way that allows you to partner up some urban people with suburban people and allow a rural person here and there to come along and join up with you, that kind of thing. When, when you push somebody into a corner, they may have wanted to be reached out to, but when you push them into a corner, they're going to stay there. Their attitude is going to be, you know, if this is the only choice you're giving me, then the hell with you. Everything's either or now. Mm -hmm. Either or. The word compromise doesn't exist. Do you, I've spoken to some people, and they, they feel like there there is some daylight between how the state operates, state government operates, versus how Washington doesn't operate. Well, it operates, but it, it, it's it's you know governance by emergency um, in Washington. Yep. Do you think that that is going to become increasingly the way it is in Georgia, as it is say in North Carolina, where Democrats? are much more competitive that that you know, once it does become more competitive that it's going to mirror the sort of washington style um i haven't given a lot of thought to that sure, question sure. i don't um it, as long as the numbers are the way they are now no because there's no need to okay but but it, if things tighten if the house majority republican shrinks to 100 in two years or whatever, I mean, not next year, but by 2020, um, then that kind of occurrence could happen. Um, it de I'll tell you what it will depend on. It will depend on who the leadership is. In, in a state government, <clears throat> um, and we're, 
we're right on the borderline. I, what I'm saying is uh, in a state of a certain size, and mm-hmm. Georgia is barely still that size, barely. Um, but in state government, who the leadership is and the weight they can carry because they're known by more of the constituents and they're back home every weekend, even during the session, goes a long way towards giving you the answer to that question of what it would be. And obviously, I don't know what the answer will be (laughs) because you don't know who the leader will be, but just look to the leader. And um, in a way, Trump has kind of shown that on the national level because he's gone to such an extreme. He's shown that who, you know, the way a person is, the way a leader is, does count. Um, we've had, um, you mentioned before, we've had a, a number of governors that had a certain temperament. I mean, that all generally kind of had the same temperament. Right. Nathan's been like that. Sonny really is the only one kind of an outlier. And Zell kind of some, somewhat, Zell would let his temper get the best of him. Um, but most of them have been uh, very uh, moderate-tempered individuals that have um, produced a climate where no matter what they say, no matter what position they take, it comes across, across as reasoned mm-hmm. and uh, soothing. You may disagree with it. But it's it's not like the bombastic rhetoric you hear at the national level. Mm-hmm. And the same for the lieutenant governor and the same for the speaker. Um, so I think a lot of that at a state level depends on, on who the leader is. Well, let, let's skip ahead and, and talk, about, talk about that. You know, we talked about 2016. How much of what we've seen uh, of, of John Ossoff comes out of nowhere in the 6th District? Forty-eight percent of the vote for a Democrat in, in in Newt Gingrich and Johnny Isaacson and Tom Price's district. How much of what we've seen with with the Democratic, if you want to call it, you know, to borrow a British phrase, fight back, is, is because of Trump, or is because of excuse me, President Trump? Is it just a a, a visceral reaction from Democrats, um... or is it something deeper than that? My opinion is that Ossoff was a creature of the media. Okay. I think a lot of the explanation for his success, and success identified here is <laughs> almost making it, um, was due to the fact that the media jumped on him mm-hmm. and gave him notoriety and credibility, which in turn uh, uh, opened up the spigot for dollars to flow to him, which he then, to his credit, used that to turn around to the rest of the country and ask for even more money. Um, he could have said everything he said about Trump in the beginning, and if the media had discounted him for whatever reason, it wouldn't have mattered. If he'd have gotten enough money to go beyond them on to paid TV, it would have, but would he have been able to get that money without his name being in the paper four times a day? Um, they latched on to him, and he, he played it smart. I mean, he did, he did what a lot of other candidates in that big pool didn't do, so they latched on to him. Um, but I never, ever, I gave an interview on WABE at the very beginning, and I said, I just don't see any way a Democrat will win that district. And it got close, and everybody thought, oh, boy. But ultimately, he got beat. And he got beat, what, four points or more. Mm-hmm. So you lose, you lose. It's in horseshoes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think some of it's Trump. Uh-huh. Uh, just like I think some of the dynamics the other day in the uh, Atlanta races was Trump. But there's other stuff going on. And I think there was other stuff going on in his race. In and next year, uh, I'll be shocked if he runs again. Uh, for, for the six, right, 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 yeah. right. It, it, he might, um, but I think he hit his high water mark this election. So, what are those other th- those other things? Or those is that demographic change, resident, the sort of shifting of of college educated white women from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party? The influx? all of the above, yes, in, uh, yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Uh, new voters registering. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
the millennials that are getting involved, they are really getting involved. Most of them aren't, <laughs> just like we know. I mean, the 18 to 34 demographic age group still is the lowest, but um, those that are, are providing a great uh, vitality mm -hmm. uh, to the electorate. Uh, and in Atlanta, they're all kind of congregated in four or five uh, council districts. And uh, I think they're, they've become empowered, they like it, and they know that they can be a difference in a race. Um, if you will look at the Atlanta results the other day, Bottoms and Moore got almost, now this is as of this morning, got almost the exact number of votes. I mean, 46,005 to 46,004. So, and this this is mayor and council chair? Council president. Yeah, correct. president, excuse me. The difference is Norwood got close. Juan couldn't get enough people or enough of Norwood's voters to vote for him. There was a huge drop off in his vote against Moore. But the, the, the black vote for the black candidates was almost identical. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that, that you know that brings me to the question of of the the twenty eighteen gubernatorial race on the Democratic side, the, the Stacey's race. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> St Stacey Abrams, Stacey, Stacey A, and Stacey B, and, and, and right. Stacey E, Stacey A and E. <laughs> it, and you you've mentioned it. it, it you you've sort of made your position pretty clear on on, on Stacey Abrams, but but her theory, and I think it's the new New Georgia project or something like that, is to find. Uh, new voters, by and large, non-white, um, mainly African American voters, um, and turn them out. And, and to a degree, she has a point that that the the uh, non-white communities turn out at a lower rate than white voters. Is there a logic there, and, and can it work? There's absolutely a logic. Um, there are almost a million unregistered voters in Georgia that, given their demographic profile, would vote Democrat, Democratic, mm -hmm. that are not registered. Okay. The question is, they've never been registered. She's failed miserably in trying to get them registered. Why can't they get registered? <laughs> There's absolutely a, a pool of voters there. Mm. If the Democrats could get a 20% of them registered and get them out to the polls, they'd win every election. Almost 90, this, now these stats are like two years old or maybe three. Almost 90% of possible Republican voters that could vote are registered to vote. You can't vote if you're not registered. Right. <laughs> so they are a they've got, that. All, they're almost, they basically say 100%. Okay. They've got their pool registered. All they got to do is get them out. Democrats have got to get their registered voters out, but then they've also got to register all this other pool, which nobody's ever been able to do. What, what is, is that because there, there are myriad you know, socioeconomic reasons for this? No, I think they're, that those are the reasons. Is, is that you're, you're talking about a, a disproportionately transient community that moves around a lot? Possibly. Uh, even within city, Possibly. I mean, even within the yeah, city, yeah, yeah, city know, limits here, no, your no, district no here. address that you can tag on to, yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, it's a conundrum for Democrats. Uh -huh. um, I used to point this out in class. Um, you can take the uh, demographics on a chart and look at the turnout. Age, gender, mm -hmm. um economic status, mm -hmm. education level. You look at the core constituency of the Democratic Party and guess what their top four groups are? What are they? The groups that vote the lowest. <laughs> That's their problem. And here's, here is the non-sequitur of it all. They're the party that to whatever extent is done for those people, they're the party that does it. Those people should be thanking them and going out and rewarding them by voting for them, and they don't. And yet the Democrats continue to fight for them, which is good. I mean, that's a 
Judeo-Christian approach to take. They keep doing for them, and they get nothing in return. So how, how break down the gubernatorial election for me. Is it simply white versus black as in it was Democratic in the Democratic primary, mm -hmm. it starts out that way. Mm -hmm. And just like with uh, the Atlanta mayor's race, right. can the uh, black candidate hold the black vote? Right. And can the white candidate uh, hold the white vote, get some black vote, and increase the white vote. And that's the same conundrum Stacey Evans has because the Democratic primary will be overwhelmingly black. Right. So, one, if she's able to get more whites out to vote, that reduces the margin. Instead of being 60% black turnout black, uh, in the primary, it could be 55. And then she's got to get them to vote for her. And then she's got to peel off 10 to 20% of the black vote. Norwood uh, faced the same dilemma mm -hmm. and almost made it. N not to conflate, obviously, the politics of Mary Norwood. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the issues Evans, and all that are but, all different, but, but as far as the demographic yeah. dynamics, it's it's the same. Now, what about on the Republican side? Because, you know, what, you know, and this is my personal opinion, what's shaping up is a very boring race a, as it <laughs> is right now. Um, the long serving Lieutenant Governor Casey Cagle. Um, serving since 2001 and 2006. Uh, Secretary of State Brian Kemp, he from here in Athens. Uh, State Senator Hunter Hill. Yep. And Mike Williams. Yep. And Clay Tippins, businessman, uh, a nephew of a state senator from Cobb County. Oh, yeah, I never made that connection. Hmm. Um, <laughs> Do you think there's still, still, to, and I would say on the Democratic side, there's not enough oxygen in the room for another candidate. No. What about on the Republican side? Well, I, I do know that the Republican hierarchy is um, not satisfied with all the candidates. Um, and they have been looking for somebody. It's almost too late. I mean, the election is actually in six months or less. Yeah, right? yeah. May? it's May. Okay. So you just yeah, it's, had it's the not, not election. It's not you know. uh, dominating the media. You're mm -hmm. going to have the legislative session dominating the media. Yeah, January through March. So you got like April and May. For, I mean, I, I don't see them doing it. You know, Speaker Ralston looked at running. He decided against it. Uh, I don't know um, that anybody else will come out. It would have to be somebody, somebody of a similar stature. Known yeah. with a whole lot of personal money. That sort of that sort of limits the. You know. Well, it doesn't limit as much on the Republican side as it does on the Democratic side. <laughs> fair, but it does it does limit it. A fair a fair point. <laughs> fair point. So wh where do you think you know get the lay of the land? Where where is the, the you know if you had to put on your prognostication cap and say who's going to come out of that? Now there's going to be a runoff on the Republican side. I'd be I'd be shocked if there wasn't a runoff. Where do you think that that race stands? Um. Right now, I would say that Cagle is the uh, prohibitive favorite. Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure Hill's going to stay in the race, but I could be wrong about that. Do you, th do you think— And I would see him as third right now. Do you think the lieutenant governor you know, obviously has the most name recognition? Is this another case of, as in like 2010, where for, for the months leading up to the race, John Oxendine was leading the race simply because John Oxendine had been there since 1994. Yeah, and everybody, yeah. Uh, no, I think Cagle's got more going for him than that. Right. I do. I do. I mean, he's um, been building up grassroots organizations for a long time. Um, what do you think the uh, the greatest threat to the Republican majority in the state is? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, this is probably going out on a limb, mm -hmm. but um, uh, if things don't end well with Trump, um, then I think everybody goes down, just like in 74 with Watergate. I think everybody You, you think stunk. that the, the party, the, the, the partisan labels are that connected that oh yeah the, oh yeah that it's it just will like, it's just like with Watergate enough people that vote in big elections either governor's race or presidential race um, 
it used to be a majority. Uh, let's say now it's 45%. That's still a lot of people. They don't pay attention to anything until the last two weeks, and all they remember is what they read in the paper or listened on the news or heard by other means nowadays on, on you know, social media or, or uh, electronic media. They will attribute a R with Trump. They attributed an R with Nixon and Republicans. You know, they lost 60 some seats in the House. In the U.S. House, and um, it didn't matter here in Georgia, so you can't really say in Georgia so and so happened because it was all Democrat anyway. But uh, Republicans got waxed just because Nixon was a Republican, and if if it doesn't end good for Trump, they'll get waxed again. Donald Trump, you mentioned it at the very outset, you know, sort of Larry McDonald as a as a proto you know, Trump. Not in his style, not in his policies, but McDonald was smart. First of all, there's one difference. <laughs> Pat Buchanan, I I always point back to Pat Buchanan in 1992 that, that he articulated a very what you would call paleo conservatism. <laughs> uh, not that that isolation. not that that means much any anymore. You know, sort of a blend of. Uh, uh, Calvin Coolidge and uh, mm -hmm. and Bob Tat or uh, Robert. A yeah, right, right. Uh, junior. Uh, but for, for my entire life, you know, I'm 31, 32 years old now, <laughs> I remember the Republican Party as the party of Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, which is to say pro-business, pro-free trade, pro-military alliances, um, anti-communism, engaged globally. Donald Trump is not. He does not stand for those things. Um, at least he doesn't articulate policies in that way. No, I don't think he stands for them, though. <laughs> um, how, how does the Republican Party nationally uh, reconcile the party of, of a Bush, of a Romney, with the party of a Donald Trump? Uh, and, and there's an election in Alabama next week, right. uh, the party of Roy Moore. Um, I think that the National Republicans are buying time. Um, I think a vast majority of them wish he were not president. Um, but they know they can't push him out because of uh, his slash their constituency. Um, the ones that have pushed back either are not going to run or they don't have much of that constituency. I think they're, you know, hoping against hope that this issue resolves itself without them having to do it. But I think there will be a day of reckoning where they realize. Uh, and Mitch McConnell fits the description that you gave a minute ago of those presidents. Mm -hmm. he knows that that party is on the verge of not existing anymore and I don't think he wants to see that happen but he doesn't know how to solve the problem and I think they're buying time and they're hoping you know here's timeline and here's a destruction line and they're hoping they don't intersect I, 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 I know uh I'm not going to mention names, but sure, I, I sure, know sure, people sure. that um, absolutely wish he had never existed, but they are too afraid to do anything about it. How is it that that is sort of a, a right-wing populist, uh, how was how that sort of worldview, I don't want to call it an ideology, I don't know if it is an ideology as much as a, just an expression uh, how was that able to seize control of the Republican Party? Well, I wrote a, a long narrative um, a while back, um, and I've written a couple other things, some of which I've gotten posted mm -hmm. online, some of which I've held off, some of which I'm trying to and I haven't been able to get. <laughs> that, that's a very involved 
Yeah, answer. there's a lot of moving parts there. there it's sure. it's yeah, a no. very involved answer. The, the way Trump got elected is explained by several instances, several instances. Um, why um, he has been able to make it to this point in 11 months without more pushback is another set of answers. Um, my contention is uh, that Trump came along at the right time and was a person willing to take advantage of that and cared so little about himself and his reputation, believe it or not, <laughs> because of his ego, that he was willing to do and say anything to tap the vote uh, that came out for him. And when you combine that and his uh, demagoguery approach with a small percentage of um, Republicans that are going to vote for a Republican regardless. You know, we used to be called yellow dog Democrats. I don't think you'll ever hear Republicans saying that Democrats will vote for a yellow dog if they've got a D by their name because some of them have done that. And then you've got, uh, frankly, what I call some of the professional whores that uh, will vote for a Republican regardless of whether they agree with them or not because it advances their own career. You combine all of those together, and he was able to get a majority of the electoral vote. It's been well documented that a lot of his core vote or what used to be a core vote of the Democratic Party 50 years ago, which was the John Bircher vote, which was the segregationist, lower income, lower education level vote. And, and, and a portion of them truly don't understand all this and have been led astray by the Pied Piper and have been used by him. It's well documented that he talked about them specifically and what he was going to do for them. And now that he's been in office, he's doing things that is absolutely going to be the last nail in their coffin. And they don't even understand that because they don't have the wherewithal to understand it. I really feel sorry for him. He's taken advantage of them. He's taken advantage of people his whole life. And he's doing it with a constituency. But if, if you remove that constituency, he would not have gotten elected. So you can say they're the difference. But in a close in a race that close, you could remove any of those constituencies I named, and it would have made a difference. But those are the people that usually don't vote. Mm -hmm. They divorce themselves from the process and the system. He convinced them to come out and vote for him through demogra demagogic means. He convinced them to go vote for him. And they bought it, and um, we'll see what happens. What do you think the, 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 the long-term effect will be in a place like Georgia? Do you think that that sort of style? Uh, no. Do you, no. Is it a transferable no. style? No. Uh, well, no. No, it's got to be a person like him. Um, so is, I guess my question is, is there a Trumpism beyond Trumpism? No. No, there's this formula I've talked about, sure, but sure. one of the things I said was he was willing to do and say what it took. Most people aren't going to do that. It took, first off, a non-politician. Right. Who didn't care if he got elected or not. He was doing it for a lark, and he didn't care. Most people running for office or have been a politician or want to have a career in politics. So they're not going to be willing to say and do some of the things he said. So that's, that's number one. Two, um, one of his reasons for getting the nomination, not necessarily the election, but getting the nomination, is because the Republican core vote, now I'm talking about the big core vote, right. the business community, the Rockefeller Republicans, and that's an acronistic term now, but I'm talking about more moderate Republicans nationwide, what, what we should call them now, the more moderate wing chamber of commerce. However uh, many there yeah, are left. Right. <laughs> they, Chris Shea is in Connecticut. <laughs> they, right, they were so arrogant that they sat there and said, and I know this because I talked to my friends in the Atlanta business community, that ain't going to happen. Don't worry. When time comes, we'll get out and vote and we'll beat him. 
they sat around, and then all of a sudden it got close to the end. They realized, oh, hell, he may get it, and it was too late. They thought, there's no way we Republicans will allow a Trump to be nominated. Well, they did. Is they it, did allow it because they didn't vote in the primary. The biggest block of votes that come out in the primary season in a presidential year to the general election, which is generally 70% turnout, People that don't vote any other time, they don't vote in the primary, and they don't vote in off-year elections for, say, governor, are Republicans. They turn out in droves to vote for the president, the presidential race. They don't vote in the primary. They didn't vote in the primary. That's how Trump won. Clinton got more votes than he got in the primary. Matter of fact, she got more votes than him and, I think, the next person. The Republican uh, power structure did not participate in the Republican presidential primary season. And, so with all the other stuff about how Trump got there, if they had taken part, they could have stopped him. Is, is that the, the explanation for why Hillary Clinton was able to carry Cobb County and Gwinnett County? Well, that was in the general election. Right, right. She, in, she carried those areas because those particular counties are changing demographically. But I will say this, and I've seen some numbers, um, I think they're speculative to the extent that, you know, a small sample was taken and they extrapolated. Mm -hmm. uh, millions of Republicans in the general election, either one did not vote for Trump or actually did vote for Clinton. But that number was so made you can't, up. So you can't transfer that and say, okay, Clinton carried Cobb, so Democrats are going to win Cobb every year after that because they ain't going to be running against Trump. Right, <laughs> right. Well, I, I think Tom Price, for example, won by... 16 points or something right, like that. Right. So I guess it may be at the national level and, and, and maybe perhaps because of, of Trump's style and rhetoric, but of course the policy coming out, especially the, the latest tax bill, would suggest that you know the election says that the Democratic Party is going to become the party of the college educated, uh, sort of flipping the script. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at, look at Donald Trump's core constituency that you've described, right, right, that, that's and the that's people that's a, that don't vote a lot. Yeah, that's right. a, that's a Wallace site. You know, a, a George Wallace Absolutely. type coalition. Absolutely. Whereas Hillary Clinton is carrying. If you, you look at 1968. Right. Go back to 1968. Right. right. Look at where George Wallace won, and then look at where Richard Nixon and and, and Hubert Humphrey add those together. Right. And and, and that's yeah. George Wallace carried Michigan just like Trump did. Is that going to be something that that it could, it could if 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 the current train if the train stays on the current track, oh. it it could. Which is of course, a, <laughs> which could then be a death knell for Republicans because those are the groups that vote the least. Well, and you got to have somebody like Trump that reaches deep into their soul to get them to come out and vote, or they're not going to come vote. Right. I mean, that's what Bobby Kennedy did. He was reaching deep into the soul of a certain type of voter. They were going to come out in droves. He had a he had a crush Nixon, but there's been no Democrat like him since then, with the exception of Clinton. He's he came the closest. And I'm not saying he came close, but he came the closest. Hmm. <laughs> so Bill Clinton. Right. Right. <laughs> right. right. To you. Yeah. Hillary Clinton, I, you know, I, I think would have. Uh, she was much more interested in the, the governing aspects. Not that, not that, not that Bill Clinton wasn't. Uh, oh no, no. You ask him what time it was, he'd tell you how to build a watch. Right. <laughs> but, but he just had this other good old boy part of him too that made you feel at ease. So, so you don't. She did. <laughs> to, very fair. Uh, <laughs> do you think, you know, because if you look at where the counties were, um, you know. Hillary Clinton won by larger margins than Barack Obama did uh, over over John McCain, over Mitt Romney in, in say Fulton County, DeKalb County. You go down to Florida, look at you know she's winning Miami Dade by by larger number, you know, larger percentages, uh, cutting margins of losses in like Duval County, Jacksonville. But Donald Trump was able to find those new voters in those small rural counties and just were in counties where the Republican would normally win 60, 40 now winning 80, 20. Is that a sustainable coalition? No, you don't think so. No. First off, she got the number she got cause she was a woman. I mean, she got a lot of women out to vote that normally wouldn't have voted. 
regardless of demographic profile. Um, but no, uh, <clears throat> um, this, this country, this republic under our Constitution, I don't think, uh, Madison didn't think somebody like Trump would come along, <laughs> but he did. But I don't think this country would structurally allow a continuing type of candidate like Trump. Do you think there will be a uh, a primary challenge, a Republican primary challenge? It's too early to tell. I, look, I'm I'm taking even bets that he's not even around the end of next year. It, do you think that the resignation, indictment, all of the above? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you, know, ra- you know, trying to wrap up here. Uh, what, what do you th- What do you think the the Democratic and Republican parties here in Georgia look like uh, in terms of you know, demographic makeup, ideology. What they look like yeah, demographically? Ten, yeah, 10, uh, 20, 10 20 years from party, now. Oh, 10 or 20 years from now? Yeah. The Democratic Party, if, 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 if current trends continue, the Democratic party, party will be overwhelmingly non-white. And that's just a, a, a continuation of... right sort of right. 1990s. But that 2000s. doesn't translate into votes. It doesn't even translate into registered voters. It's just the population. If you polled them and said, you know, what positions do you agree with and it aligns or who you're going to vote for, but it doesn't mean anything. Um, the Republican Party would have um, basically everybody else. And that's somewhat the way it is now. It's just that the numbers are different. And so, therefore, it's a little tighter. But the, the Republican Party, uh, the Democratic Party, has um, been captured by what we would call the, the liberal wing of that party. Uh, and they, the, the, the fact is both parties are, are equally dogmatic, and they both do not want to compromise, and they both uh, do not allow anybody in that doesn't look like them. And, you know, that's, that's where we're at in Georgia. How does that change? Does it, does it take... You're making well, me well, think too hard because, it, like I said, I'm disengaged from... Do, do, it. Does it take, you know, <laughs> what, what V.O. Key says, you know, does it take a critical, a critical realigning event or yes, is this sort of a does. secular it, no, realignment? It's always got to take a critically realigning event. Watergate was one. Mm-hmm. Trump was one for them, but that same thing may be a realignment the other way, the same thing. Um, the dynamic in Georgia, again, is within borders. So uh, I've seen projections that Georgia will have 15 million people by 2050, or is that too far out? I can't it might remember. be 2040. 2040. It might be. Have 15 million people. So obviously the key is, that's another third. So the key is, who are those 5 million people? Are they and white? where do they live? Are they white? Mm-hmm. Well, I can tell you where they're going to live. <laughs> <laughs> About 16 the, counties. The biggest, <laughs> the biggest problem in this state is the division between the state. That is the biggest problem by far. The two, no candidate wanting two Georgia. The two Georgia. It's really three. three yeah, three is the, the more recent. It is by far the biggest issue. No candidate wants to talk about it because it involves race. But it is the biggest problem, and it in turn creates the co-equal biggest problem, which is our public education system. But they'll all live around this big area. The, will they be white or non-white? Hmm. Well, and, and, and that will be driven by the policies of state government, which are developed by the governor and the General Assembly and the laws they pass. Governor setting policy, General Assembly passing laws, who will they attract? Again, I mentioned that we went from 3 million to 10 million. The Democratic leadership of this state engaged in policy and law passing that created an environment that brought in a certain type of person. In 1974, I wrote a paper. No, 
that's not right. 1978, I wrote a paper. It was uh, Busby's end of his first term. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a paper. And the thrust of the paper was, Busby's been great for Georgia. And I cited all these stats of growth. But I said, every person he's bringing into this state is a Republican. And that was an exaggeration, obviously. But it wasn't generally wrong. He's bringing in Republicans. I said, this is going to catch up to Democrats at some year. Can you still, and I gave that paper to Al Burris. Can you still say that, that, that young professionals, um, the entrepreneurial class, if you will, mm -hmm. are Republicans? No, no, absolutely. No, not anymore. No, no. No, I'm just saying that the governor and general assembly through what they do, will attract a certain type of person mm -hmm. to move here. Again, the Democrats weren't paying attention to the political fallout of it. They were just, you know, come one, come all. I remember a stat when Joe Frank was governor, um, and I, I really can't remember it, but they had a stat out after several years of him being in office, how many new jobs were created every week. Mm -hmm. and it was like it was something ridiculous, like 500 or 1,000 every week for a long period of time. So we were doing things. We created an infrastructure. People aren't going to want to move down, transfer our jobs. I wrote a letter to the mm -hmm. editor in the Marietta Journal when I was chair of the party. I said, we're a victim of our own success. We've created a great environment. People get transferred, and I knew this because I'd heard this living in Cobb County, which I passed on to the people. When I, all these people were moving down, being transferred with their businesses. Mm -hmm. Kicking and screaming, depending on when you talk to them at the beginning, kicking and screaming, they had to move to the sordid south. Two years later, they get a notice from their company, we're transferring you somewhere else. They said, oh, hell no. I love it here. I'm not leaving. They quit their job. We created an environment for people to want to live here. But most of them voted Republican. But you're right. Now, people coming in like that with high tech and so forth, no, they're the, you know, they're the millennials, the younger millennials, or whatever that next generation is. It's 18 or whatever. <laughs> so or it's called. And um, they're, it, at most, they're agnostic politically, yeah. but they're progressive thinkers. So the, they're ripe to be recruited by Democrats, but a lot of them are Democrats. So it's different. But will the next Republican governor do things to attract those kind of people. If they don't pay attention to it like Democrats did not, they will be the architect of their own demise. Well, with that, <laughs> um, Steve Anthony, anything else you... Uh, you no, want? I've talked too long. Already. Oh, well. <laughs> you, that there's... there's Always room for more conversation. Well, I could I could say a lot, <laughs> and some of it I won't say. But, <laughs> well, um, I do appreciate it. Uh, on behalf of the Richard B. Russell Library, um, thank you for taking part in the two-party well, Georgia thank Oral you. History Project. Thank you. Really do Great appreciate pleasure. it, sir. Great pleasure. Thank you.